Good morning, everyone, on the live stream by way of conference call and freeconferencecall.com. Good morning to everyone gathered here in the chapel. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have all of you. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and prayers as we open up. Uh, we're going to be coming out of the Sunday School book, Explore the Bible, page 10, session 1. Title letter, the title of this morning's lesson is Sent, Believers are Set Apart for God's Purposes. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time and opportunity to come before you in your presence and, and get into your word, Father, so each and every one of us can be taught what you were saying to us about being sent. Lord, I ask you right now, as we talk about the principles sent and what that means, not only in the context of today's lesson, but how to apply to us, but also that we will listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. The second thing I'm going to pray, Father, is that we will share once we listen and have been sent. And the third thing I'm asking you to help us do, Father, and also importantly, is that we would rely on the Spirit, that we would listen to the Holy Spirit, that we would share the Word of God and that we would rely on the power of the Spirit. Those are the three overarching things that I want for us to receive from this morning's lesson. Empower me by your Spirit to teach your word. Lord, for without Jesus Christ, I can't do anything. But without the indwelling and the empowering of the Spirit, I can't do anything. Father, take control right now, Father. Let me decrease. I ask that you do these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, in this morning's lesson, Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12, and the title of this morning's message in the Sunday School book is Session 1 on page 10. And believers are set apart for God's purposes. We're going to see two specific people this morning that are set apart for God's purposes, and that's Barnabas and Saul. Now, Saul is a, is a Hebrew or Jewish name. Paul was a Gentile Roman name. Okay? And we know that Saul of Tarsus was converted to Christ on the road to Damascus as a Pharisee as he was going to the city of Damascus, the capital city of the nation of Syria, to persecute Christians by, by having them bound, brought into prison, and taking them back to Jerusalem, where he was coming from. And I don't want to rehash all of that. Three things I want to say. One, we're going to be looking at the Gentile church, splurging and at the headquarters for the Gentile church, for the most part, is going to be in Antioch and Pisidia, in Asia Minor, which is the modern-day country of Turkey. Now, the headquarters for the overall church, but especially the more Jewish wing of the church, of course, is in the city of Jerusalem, the city of the Great King. Now, Antioch and Pisidia is not too far from both the regions of Cappadocia and Galatia. Galatia, of course, is another book written in the Bible, later on in the New Testament. What we're going to see here is in the 13th chapter of Acts, is that all of us, of course, have heard about the conversion of Saul, of Tarsus, from being an unrighteous, unsaved Pharisee to being a born-again believer and a disciple of Jesus Christ. And he immediately began to preach the gospel after his conversion in the city of Damascus. Barnabas was the one that was able to tell the other disciples, and especially the other apostles, that his conversion was real. He then hears about the Gentile church being birthed in Antioch and Pisidia. Now, the reason why I'm laying emphasis on Antioch and Pisidia, there's another Antioch in Scripture. That Antioch is in Syria, not too far from Damascus. So these, there are two different Antiochs in the New Testament and the Bible. There's one in Syria, and there's one in Asia Minor, which we know today is the modern-day nation of Turkey. The Antioch we're going to be talking about today, where the Gentile church is pretty much taking off, and you're going to see the spread of the gospel not only in Antioch, the city, but throughout the Roman Empire is in Turkey. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to read page number 10 real quick. Sent. Believers are set apart for God's purposes. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. What's the difference between being sent and being called? Okay. The call comes from the Holy Spirit. He uses cooperating churches in sending providing confirmation of the call and provisions for service. Even if no agency is available, missionaries depend on churches to send in and support them. Let me explain what that word agency means for missionaries. Normally, if a person is called to be a missionary, there's a missionary organization, sometimes affiliated with a denomination and sometimes not. It's a part of a parachurch ministry. Parachurch just simply means they work alongside of a church, but they're not 
uh, directly connected with a specific church or a specific denomination. An example of a parachurch ministry would be organizations like Navigators, uh, Campus Crusade, which is now called Crew, uh, and there's some others, Wycliffe Bible Translators, and they're an organization that helps translate, you know, the Bible that's in the New Testament. So those are examples of parachurch ministry. Okay. Missionaries depend on churches to send them and support them. While Barnabas and Saul were sent by the church in Antioch, Jesus calls every believer to make disciples wherever they go. Let me say a couple of things. Then we're going to work on answering the question on page 10. We may be able to answer it this time but without having to go through other aspects of the lesson. All right. Jesus calls every believer to make disciples wherever they go. In the Great Commission, in Acts chapter, not Acts, but Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and 20, is one of the Great Commission passages in the New Testament. And in that passage, Jesus says, Go ye therefore, in verse 19, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Okay? Now, so that's a commission, of course, that he gives immediately to the apostles just before his ascension. But that has an application to us as well. The apostles, of course, have died and gone to be with the Lord, have been for, uh, for close to a thousand years now, right? So then the apostles were to teach other believers, win other believers to Christ, build them up in the word, and have them mature in the faith. They are to go out and win unbelievers to Christ, Okay. Build them up in the faith, disciple them. And then they would go out and win unbelievers to Christ. And they would build them up in the word and disciple them. So this has an application to us as well. Now we're going to answer this question quickly on the, the bottom of the page. It says, for what purpose in life can you say you are set apart? That's an individual question that's going to differ slightly for each person. That part of it. How do you understand God's purpose for your life? Now, would anyone like to share with us whatever they wrote down for? How do you know God? What purpose has God set you apart for in life? Well, the purpose is to set apart you go out and be disciples. Okay. If you teach one another, and they say, I'm shopping on it. Okay. So that's what we're supposed to be doing. But for God to be, you know that God sent you, God came to you. Right. God okay. came to you and spoke to you. Okay. God um, gave you a vision. See a vision from God. Okay. That's what we're doing. You know, for His will of your life, that will get up every day and you ask when you give it to the Word and you read it. Okay. And He'll direct you. Yeah. Okay, good. Close hey, now. Anybody else? Very good. Go ahead. I was saying that the uh, direction on my life was to uh, serve and help. Serve and help? Wherever I God points me in the area of need. Okay. And then also in the second part is if I kind of like put the second part on a um, song version, if it's not for the Lord on my side, uh, where would I be? Huh? Okay. So, so that's how I handle that. Also, I wanted to point out when you were going earlier that all this background that we got, remember that God remains in the same business today for us as well. You know, he wants us to also, he all remains calling people to Jesus Christ. Right. And right. sending us out to share the gospel, which is based on the whole book of Acts, which is centered around the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And so Paul, under the influence of the Holy Ghost, Minister Solomon, under the spirit of the Holy Ghost, is here with us today. Okay. okay, so we all are under the spirit of the Holy Ghost, and he's working everything out for all mm -hmm. those believers who really trust. Mm -hmm. So what I want us to see from the answer to the both of them just heard, and some things that I just shared, not only does God call Barnabas and Saul in Acts chapter 13, but he also calls us mm -hmm. to serve as well. Mm -hmm. He calls us to share the gospel with people, the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection Amen. of Jesus Christ. And for those unbelievers who respond to us sharing the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're to help them to grow and nurture them as babes in the Lord. Mm -hmm. we, when we were born into the world physically, we were babies, mm -hmm. and we became small children. But someone had to, have, we had parents, mother and father, had to help raise us 
and guide us and provide discipline and direction. And those are some of the things that we as believers need to be doing. Okay. Understand the context. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. First paragraph says, aside from waiting on the Holy Spirit in Acts chapters 1 and 2, the church has been constantly on the move. The second half of Acts describes the advance of the gospel having breached the Gentile barrier with Peter's witness to Cornelius. The gospel continued to expand. So that's the first place in the book of Acts where we see the gospel definitely going to Gentiles. It's in Acts chapter 10 where the apostle Peter with six other men who were uh, with the circumcision party. What that meant was those were Jewish believers in Christ that had been circumcised. And more than likely, they may have also been Pharisees who went with Peter to Cornelius' household to sh see uh, Peter share the gospel with him, see and hear, and share the gospel with the Gentiles there and Cornelius, and see them come to know the Lord. That's what that's talking about. Word reached the church in Jerusalem that people in Antioch had become believers. At first, only Jews were being reached. Then believers from Cyprus and Cyrene came and shared with the Gentiles who embraced the faith. Now, there are two different geographical locations where these believers were from and where they went to. They were Gentile believers coming from Cyprus, which is an island in the Mediterranean Sea, and Cyrene, which is basically in North Africa. They're Gentile believers that came from those two countries up to Antioch and Pisidia in Turkey and started reaching Gentiles for Christ. And this is where we start seeing the growth of the Gentile wing of the church, okay? In other words, Jew, um, Gentile background believers is what I mean, okay? So it goes on to say, the Jerusalem church sent Barnabas, who was born in Cyprus, to see what was happening. When he saw how God was working, Barnabas went to Tarsus and brought Saul back to help. For years, they strengthened the new church. The believers in Antioch learned of a famine that would affect the entire region. They collected relief funds, which they sent to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Saul in Acts chapter 11, verse number 30. Comparing or well, completing their relief mission, Acts 12, 25, Barnabas and Saul returned to Antioch in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. As they were worshiping, the Holy Spirit directed the church to send Barnabas and Saul to take the gospel to other places. They first went to Cyprus, Barnabas' hometown, accompanied by John Mark, they traveled westward across the island to Paphos. So if they went to Cyprus, where Barnabas was from, they basically, both Barnabas and Saul, they began to evangelize the entire island of Cyprus, from starting from the eastern side of the island all the way to the western side. Now, Paphos, I think, may have been a port city and a capital city, which we're going to see a little bit later on. So when you go home and you look at the map, Go to the Mediterranean Sea and look for the island of Cyprus. That's where Barnabas is from. Okay? Now, Barnabas is very interesting. His name means son of encouragement, son of consolation. When you lead new believers to Christ, let me say this, and I'm going to say this quickly because I don't know, it's 9.15 already. You need to encourage new believers in their walk with the Lord. Let them know that they have been taken out of the kingdom of darkness, under the domain and dominion of Satan and sin, mm. and they've been transferred into the kingdom of light Amen. and the kingdom of righteousness. And they now have a new nature, and they have a new master, mm. all right? And then they need to begin to start in, with your help, with your direction, and your encouragement to get into the Word of God. When a baby's born to the world, What's the liquid drink that you give that baby Give that baby in order to grow? Beginning with the letter M. Milk. All right. Now, you do get some, well, not solid food right away. It's more pureed. It's heavily strained. But as they grow, you can't just continue to give them pureed strained food, right? You have to give them some solid food at some point. So they have to get into the, 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 strained, uh, the strained food of the Word of God, the milk, and some some material that's not too tough to chew on and swallow. Mm -hmm. But as they grow, they have to begin to get into the solid meat of the Word of God. But that takes some encouragement. That takes some direction. Mm -hmm. That takes time, okay? Amen. So, <laughs> all right, I just wanted to say that. I'm going to keep going. So, no, no, no. Okay. As they were worshiping, the Holy Spirit directed the church to send Barnabas and Saul to take 
the gospel to other places. They first went to Cyprus, Barbas' hometown, accompanied by John Mark, they traveled westward across the island of Paphos. If the gospel can continue to bear fruit, the missionaries encountered two types of opposition. You're going to encounter opposition, folks. Mm -hmm. Share the gospel. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it just comes with the territory. The devil does not want any of us, not me, not you, not any of us, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with anyone. That's number one. And number two, when you do share it, he's going to try to do everything in his power to make sure that unbeliever, one, doesn't listen to anything you have to say, and two, if they do listen, that, well, it doesn't take root in their heart. Mm -hmm. Because there are different responses to the gospel based upon the condition of that unbeliever's heart. Some receive it immediately with joy. They enjoy hearing it. But the word of God doesn't penetrate their heart in the sense that it comes, the word of God comes into their heart, convicts them of their sin. They have a godly sorrow about their sin, and they only see Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation. There's some that make a profession of faith, but when trials and tribulations come and persecution comes, they fall away because of that. They're not genuine believers. Some of the pleasures of this life, the good times, the one of the party. Choke out the word and it's not fruitful. Mm -hmm. The only one that's a genuine believer is when the word of God, they hear it, they understand it, they receive them into life, they obey it, and you see them bear fruit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's what I'm talking about. Hey, keep in mind the devil never takes a day off. No, he doesn't. He has a lot of workers. Now, those workers are called demons. Mm -hmm. Those are his soldiers. That's right. And he has an army of them mm -hmm. with different assignments. And he has a plan, he being the devil and his demons, he has a plan for all of our lives. Right. Just like God, through his angels, have a plan for our lives too. So you have opposition. Externally, conflicts occur when a false prophet named Elymas contended against them as a witness to the Roman proconsul. Internal conflict also happened. John Mark left and returned to Jerusalem. Why? It wasn't because of opposition to persecution or persecution. The only apparent change was the group uh, became known as Paul and his companions. Mm -hmm. Originally it was just, of course, Saul and Barnabas being called and sent. When they went to the island of Cyprus, a number of people had given their life to the Lord, and that group expanded. Doesn't tell us the exact number. Whereas previously it was Barnabas and Saul, perhaps John Mark was jealous on behalf of his cousin Barnabas. His reaction eventually caused a split between Barnabas and Paul. That's Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 41. We'll have to deal with that more in a later lesson on the split, because that's kind of getting ahead of ourselves. God continued to use each man in the furtherance of the gospel. In the end, Christ's gospel always wins. At the bottom of the first question or second question, Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. Look for ways to Barnabas out their cost. Okay. Let's turn it over, explore the text. Can someone volunteer to read uh, under list in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3? Now in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, son of Simon, who was called Niger, Lucy of Serenia, and Nana, a close friend of Herod the Petrarch, and Saul. As they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. Okay, praise God. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his word. In verse 1, the infant church at Antioch began because believers who fled the persecution in Jerusalem came and proclaimed the gospel to Jewish people. Soon other believers from Cyprus and Cyrene arrived at Antioch. So let's keep in mind, one of the Great Commission passages is also found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Notice you have people from Cyprus and Cyrene going to Antioch. They're obeying the spread of the gospel to other nations. You have, what, you have two groups of people from two different nations going and spreading the gospel to a group of individuals in another country. Turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Those of you have your Bibles. And I'm going to read this quickly. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Keep your hands in Acts chapter 13 and your finger in the book. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, emphasis on the Great Commission. 
of the geographical locations of where the gospel is to be spread in terms of the countries, and also relying on the power of the Spirit. Acts 1 and 8 in the King James Version says, But ye shall receive power, this is what Jesus says, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, starting in the city of the great king, okay, and in all Judea, one of the provinces, and in Samaria. Now notice Samaria. Who went through Samaria in John chapter 4? Jesus. Jesus did. He spoke to the woman of Samaria. There were also a group of Samaritan, uh, Samaritans that had leprosy that Jesus also healed. And only one came back to thank him in the book of Luke. I think it's the 17th chapter. I could be wrong on the chapter. Right. And unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, two things. Jesus is saying, look, you've got to rely on the power of the Spirit. And now you're going to receive the geographical location. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost part of the earth. They're now beginning to take it to the uttermost part of the earth. Turn back to Acts chapter 13. Okay? <laughs> Hearing the news, the church of Jerusalem sent Barnabas on a fact-finding journey. Seeing how God was working, Barnabas quickly went to Tarsus and brought Saul to help. After a year, they returned to Jerusalem with a financial gift to aid the suffering saints. Returning to Antioch, they joined other prophets and teachers in the young congregation. Some scholars argue that these designations developed into the office of pastor-teacher in Ephesians 4.11. Now, in Ephesians 4.11, that's a passage in the book of Ephesians where the Apostle Paul gives specific offices in the church of which God calls men to to help build up other believers. And pastor-teacher is one of them. Mm -hmm. And the King James Version has a render it's pastors and teachers. And the Greek is a uh, pastor-teacher, so it's, it's one office. It's not two separate offices there. And, of course, the other one is the office of a prophet. Mm -hmm. Now, it goes on to say the term prophet refers to a person spiritually gifted to proclaim the word of God. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 6, which is one of the other list of the gifts of the Spirit is found in Romans chapter 12. Another one, of course, is Ephesians chapter 4, verses, uh, I think, 10 and 11 or 11 and 12. Another one is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Those chapters in the New Testament give us the list of the gifts of the Spirit. In addition to Barnabas and Saul, several other leaders served the church. Three are mentioned specifically. First was Simeon. Some writers argue that Simeon was from North Africa. Contributing to his identification is the mention of Lucius of Cyrene. Now, if you remember back during the time of the crucifixion of Christ, on the day that he's going to be crucified, after Roman has him flogged and with a cat on his tail, and he's on the Via Della Rosa, he's on the path to the hill called Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. Jesus is having a hard time lifting the cross beam of the cross mm -hmm. because he had been beaten and bloodied so bad. It was a Cyrenian who the Romans compelled to pick up the cross of Christ. There, there was someone from Cyrene from North Africa right there in Jerusalem mm -hmm. already, you know, there to see Jesus and to, to see him crucified. So the gospel eventually reached Cyrene at some point. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's where... Um, the guy that lifted the, uh, the cross for Christ was from. Cyrene was the capital city of the Roman district of Cyrencia in North Africa. The Greeks in Antioch received the gospel from believers who came from Cyprus in Cyrene. Acts chapter 11, verse 20. Many filled out the complement of teachers serving the church. Luke identifies him as a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Now, what do we know about the Herods from last week's lesson? Does somebody raise their hand and name the overarching theme that we know about the Herod family? Go ahead. Treachery. Treachery, yeah. They were very treacherous. Uh, they, were, they were, I think, maybe considered half-Jews, not Samaritans, right. but they were from, from Edom. Right. They were descendants of Esau and the Edomites. Right. And so, of course, the Edomites didn't have a very good relationship right. with, with, the, with the Israelites. So that may have been one of the reasons why the Romans chose the Herod family, you know, to have some type of political rule right. in the nation of Israel. All right. It goes on to say, the astonishing reference deserves more than passing notice. Commentators identify this Herod as Herod Antipas, who was Tetrax of Galilee at the time of Jesus' birth and crucifixion. 
Luke chapter 3, verse 1, and Luke chapter 23, verses 7 through 12. Here I just want to emphasize at this worship service that they're having in Antioch, it's a general worship service. It doesn't say it's specifically like an ordination service, which is a special service separate and apart from a Sunday service that's set aside uh, for the public, uh, you know, sending off and also confirming the call of someone that's in the ministry, where there's going to be a catechizer asking ministry candidates questions, where there's going to be someone that's going to lay hands on them, and there's going to be a ministry. This, this seems to be a general worship service of believers. And at some point during that worship service, they also began to fast and pray. And you notice it's when the fasting and praying took place in the context of that worship service, along with the three other people mentioned, God says, separate the two people, Barnabas and Saul, and separate them for the work whereunto I have called them. And the Lord says, they, the church being obedient, they laid their hands on them. That seems like the entire church may be doing it and not just a, a group of other ministers that come to be a witness at a specific ordination service. I, just before a person gives a message to encourage the candidates to be faithful in preaching the word of God and also living holy lives, that kind of thing. So I'm just bringing this out that they were listening, the congregation, to the leading of the spirit in general worship service. And when they began to do two specific disciplines, fast and pray, God gave them further direction on two men they're supposed to be called by God, and they're to separate and give their full support to and send them out and preach the word. Okay? So we see here Barnabas and Saul are officially being commissioned as missionaries on the first missionary journey. So I want to lay down on everybody's heart today to listen to the Lord through his word. God may give you a specific assignment, just like he gave Saul and Barnabas, through the church being obedient to God, listening to the direction of the Holy Spirit, and through fasting and prayer to go to these locations to preach the gospel, God may do the same with you as well. It may not be in the same, you know, you go into a foreign country, but it may mean going to another neighborhood not too far from where you live, and God putting that neighborhood upon your heart, and you with a group of other believers in the neighborhood that you live, that you go to that area. And you start developing relationships with the people and sharing the word of God. Let me let me say it that way. Okay. The Greek term suggests man was like a foster brother to Herod. The gospel is the power of God for salvation for anyone, regardless of status. That's important for that to be in there for two reasons. The Herods were known to be treacherous. And if you look and read and study biblically the different Herods, they were not trustworthy people. Mm -hmm. They weren't godly people. They weren't people that read the word of God. I mean, the, the Herod we see when Jesus is born, of course, he kills all the infants. Because he's afraid that this God that's called the king of the Jews is going to overthrow him. Right? And, and then we see a Herod in the book of Acts. He kills James with the sword, the Lord's brother. Mm -hmm. And then he imprisons Peter because he, Peter he saw all believes the Jews. He thought they were happy about it. So, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, what I'm saying is, even somebody that's associated with him. What a family. That's right. He can give your life to the Lord. God can save anyone. Even somebody closely associated. This is Dean saying in the, in the south most of North Carolina. He's a scoundrel. <laughs> and somebody calls you a scoundrel thinks in North Carolina, that's not a good thing. You're not a good guy. You stay away from that boy. Right. That's He's boy. not a good person. <laughs> ain't nothing good coming out of there. That's right. Ain't nothing good that family. <laughs> but thank God. The Lord is able to save even them. Amen. I'm going to go through this great says When Luke recorded that they were worshiping the Lord and fasted, that meant the entire Antiochian church, not just the teachers. The congregation was not necessarily seeking special guidance when the Holy Spirit spoke. The worship they were focused on praise and adoration of the Lord. The syntax and verb forms indicate the worship and fasting were ongoing, not sporadic. And it was in this context that you see the Lord through that congregation, God calling Barnabas and Saul and then sending them. All right? It says in the fourth paragraph, it says the entire congregation appeared to have laid hands on them. Instead of a type of ordination for ministry, most writers believe this was an act of the church's expression of approval and impartation of authority. They affirmed Barnabas and Saul and were sent off. 
And one of the things that meant that they were set off, they were released from whatever duties that they had, specifically in the church of Antioch. Remember, they were both in the church of Antioch, both Barnabas and Saul, to work with helping to nurture and build up to the believers that were there. So that part of their ministry ended. They were no longer dealing specifically with building up the believers that had come to know the Lord in Antioch. In other words, it would like be for me example. Um, I'm here at First Baptist Church of Suitland, you know, helping out in Sunday school and teaching Sunday school, okay, and leading the worship service. And then the church uh, would get together in worship service. The Holy Spirit would say, look, I want you to separate Minister Solomon for the work I've called him to. And, and, and I want you to send him off to another location to do another work. And so the church in general would approve of that. The pastor would recognize that and say, well, Reverend Solomon, we appreciate you, all your work here. Thank God for what you do. The Lord is raising you up to work somewhere else and, and to send you off. That's maybe the best application I can give of that. So I know this is kind of not going through the specific details of the lesson in the book, but I want to kind of okay. get those things nailed down, okay? Since God calls believers to be his witness wherever he leads, beginning with our families, friends, neighbors, and coworkers, we have his commission to share the good news. Now, let's go back to the question quickly on page number 11. It says, as you read Acts 13, 1 through 12, look for ways Barnabas and Saul lived out their calling. One of the ways they lived out their calling is that when the church did what? When they fasted and prayed, what did Barnabas and Saul do? They were separated. They left that church. They were set apart. They ended up having to leave the church in Antioch. Okay, so they left that church for a certain amount of time to go to the island of Cyprus where Barnabas is from. Okay, that's I'm going to have to look. I don't know how far um, Antioch of Pisidia in Turkey is from Cyprus, but it's probably quite a ways. But on, the, on that island, it's 90 miles or yeah. so. Okay. 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 Yeah, it may be 90 miles. So that's one of the things that we see already, that with that separation, there's ascending. And we're going to answer that question a little more. But there's a question going back to page 13. What does being called look like for believers today? We would like to share with us the answer they gave to that question. What does the, a God's call look like for believers today? Today meaning August, uh, well, September 1st, sorry, 2023. <laughs> what would you say? I would like to um, use an example here in our room. I think um, like we have our sister Annette right here with us, and she's from the islands. Mm -hmm. This is her last day with us. She's going back. That's right. But look, she comes from the islands, and what did she do? Huh? By the Holy Spirit, come join First Baptist Church of Suitland for how long you been here, sister? Three weeks. Three weeks. One month. Three months. One month. Three months. Three months. Okay, okay. And then she's going back. So I was just thinking how we were talking about laying on hands, but before she goes back, I would like to say we pray a little bit for her. So the Lord is going to use the three months that you were here mm -hmm. and whatever you received, you know, worshiping here with us in Sunday school and our general morning worship services, those things that you've acquired and the Lord has helped to, to put in your life, you're going to be able to go back home from where you're from and share that with other believers. And you're going to bless many people. I know that you are. That's one of the things, Joe. Go ahead. I, I think, too, this, this one hour. Uh, question of what does being called look like mm -hmm. for the leaders today. Uh, we were talking about in that uh, she came here. Mm -hmm. uh, she didn't look for everything else. She looked for a church. Mm -hmm. She's here. Uh, to, to walk in God's character uh, a verbal testimony, uh, a living testimony. Mm -hmm. That that's what it looks like to me. Okay, walking yeah. God's character. Now, yeah. second part of that question: How can you encourage people as they follow God's call? What can we say and do to help encourage people to follow God's call? And anyone share with us the answer they wrote down for that? Walking testimony. Okay. <laughs> 
testimony. Okay. So you can we, tell people how God has worked in your life, what, yes. what you've seen, mm -hmm. and how you've how you invested your life so that it might make the same Amen. difference for them. Okay, so we can share with them how the Lord has changed our lives and specific things in terms of how the Lord has changed us. And it can inspire them to want to change. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, anybody else? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, in addition to that, sometimes, especially with missionaries, you can also provide financial support for them also. Right. It's really difficult when they're away. Yeah. It is. And there are mission organizations that we can contribute to that if we don't know a specific missionary, say, for example, a, a member of our church or other churches that, you know, we fellowship with, mm -hmm. we can pro provide either monthly financial support or, you know, financial support them even if it's not on a monthly basis because it is very difficult. I mean, it's not easy. Uh, you know that if you work a job every week or every two weeks, if you, you know, you work an hourly wage job, you have a salary, you're going to receive a paycheck. It's not that way with missionaries. Mm -hmm. Foreign missionaries have to, first of all, leave whatever country they're from, learn a new language, learn a new culture, uh, learn the laws of the country they're being sent to, the culture of the people, and the customs of the people. That's not very easy. So they have to make a lot of adjustments. Okay? So one of the ways, like she said, we can do to support them and send financial support. We also can fast and pray and, um, for them and then uh, make them know that we Call. That's right. We can fast and pray, and we can let them know we're a spiritual resource if they ever call, and to pray for them on a consistent basis. Okay. At the bottom of the page, we have key doctrine. It says evangelism and missions. It is truly, it is the duty and privilege of every follower of Christ and of every church of the Lord Jesus Christ to endeavor to make disciples of all nations. Turn quickly over to the book of Luke, chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 49. Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 49. This is also a great commission passage. So we have several of them in the New Testament. We have the one in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and 20. We have one in Mark chapter 16, verses, I think, uh, of 15 and 16. And this is the one in the Bible according to Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 49. It says, and said unto them, referring to Jesus, Thus it is written, and thus it behooves Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So the content of the death, burial, and resurrection of the priest is the repentance and the remission of sin. We have to call men and women to repent, to make a U-turn, have a change of mind about their self-sin in God. And we would preach the forgiveness of sin. And that forgiveness only comes through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death on the cross because he paid the penalty of our sins by dying in our place on the cross on the sin. He was buried and he rose again and he shed his blood to wash away our sins. Verse 48, and you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be, be endued with power from on high. So Jesus has commanded the disciples in verse number uh, 49 to wait in the city of Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit falls upon you, he indwells you, and he fills you. And then you go out on this important mission. Turn over to Romans chapter 10. Romans the 10th chapter, verses 13, 14, and 15. <laughs> Romans the 10th chapter may be a very familiar passage for many of us, verses 13, 14, and 15. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? So the first calling that God gives for a spiritually dead person, okay, what I mean by spiritually dead, person who hasn't received Christ. Mm. Now, another way you can put that is spiritually dead person, when you turn over to the book of Ephesians, I think of verse number 11, is they are without God, they are without Christ, and without hope in this world. That describes a lost person. Without God, without Christ, without hope. And that means they're spiritually dead. They don't have a relationship with them. That's what I mean, okay? 
It says in verse number 30, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it goes in verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That's where we come in. When you look at the first part of the verse 14, how shall they then be call on him in whom they have not believed? They can't. They can't call on him. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? If they haven't heard on him, they definitely also can't call on him. Then it goes, and how shall they hear without a preacher? So he, he, us as preachers, in the sense of we're proclaiming what the word of God says about Jesus Christ to unbelievers, when the Holy Spirit convicts them, they can repent, and then they can call on him. And once they've heard about it, they can believe. And when they repent and believe, they can ask him to come into their lives. That is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And verse number 15. 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? Mm -hmm. That's where we come in. We have to go out from wherever we are and preach the word of God. That's our families, our communities, and our jobs. And it goes on to say, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of grace, of gospel of peace, and bring good tidings glad tidings of good things. That's a quotation. Except, you know, as it is written, except they, they preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. That's a quotation, I believe, from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. And that's talking about individual that is running on their feet and the watchman that's out on the wall like a guard tower of a city that protects the wall. That watchman sees an individual running. And they could tell whether that person is coming to bring good news. And so that runner, as the watchman says, look, this person is uh, coming you know, to bring some news, they open the gates of the city, and they come in and tell the news. That, that's what it's referring to. Okay. I'm going to go kind of quickly here because time is kind of passing the dry. I'll read share, Acts chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. So, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Arriving in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. They also had John as their assistant. When they had traveled the whole island as far as Paphos, they came across a sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet named Bar Jesus. This is the external opposition, but the Jewish false prophet by the name of Bar Jesus. Now, Bar means son of. So this can be translated as son of the Savior or son of Jesus. He's also referred to as a false prophet. Jewish false prophet at that. So this man here is like an individual, like the Old Testament false prophet, that specifically is sent to discourage and oppose what the true prophets are saying in their message to the people. And they wanted to tell the people what they wanted to hear and not the true message of God and what they needed to hear. All right? And it says he, and it goes on to say, he was the with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, that is the meaning of his name. In other words, Elymas is translated as sorcerer. This man was involved in a work of that's in the aspect of what they call the occult. Occult comes from, a, I think, a Greek word which means secret or hidden thing. And one of the things that a sorcerer does is they're involved in things called incantations and magic formulas. Yeah. Uh, they observe time. And they use those methods to try to uh, tell people that this is how you can know God and look into the future. Right. So those are the crooked ways of getting people to try to think they have a relationship with God. Right. Remember, think about crystal ball gazing. I want to know what's going to happen in the future, so I'm going to go to get a person who can look into a crystal ball and tell me the future. I'm going to get you there. Uh, look at the hand. The, the lines on your hand, the size of the hand, and use that to determine as well whether you can find out what's going to take place. Go ahead, Ed. Can you explain what the Pro Council was an individual that was a Roman official that was like an administrator of a province. They were like an administrator and a senator that was appointed by the Roman government to oversee a particular province. That's what a Pro Council was. So Sergius Paulus wanted to hear the word of God. But guess who's opposing him? A false prophet who's a sorcerer. 
And that's where the external opposition comes in. The devil is going to use any method he can to oppose, first of all, the person that wants to hear the word of God. In other words, the recipient. Right? And he's going to try to do whatever he can to deceive that person. Okay? Now, I'm going to have to go quickly because we're running up against time. All right? But LMA is the sorcerer. That is the meaning of his name. Oppose them and try to turn the poor counsel away from the faith. Okay. Now, verses 4 through 6 is the Holy Spirit instills God's call into believers' hearts and directs them to specific places. The next bolded print in the black, same next paragraph, Barnabas and Saul first went down to Seleucia. Now, on question, on question uh, at the bottom of the page on number 12, what other evidence do we see of God's calling? The Lord sent Barnabas and Saul. Where did he send them to? Seleucia. He also sent to the next bold printed word, to Cyprus. So when we go back to the question on page number 11 at the bottom of the page, it says, as you read Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12, look for ways Paul and Barnabas lived out their calling. They went to different places. We see in the text, they went to Cyprus. They went to Salem, okay? And they went to Seleucia. So they're going to different places geographically, all right? In the middle of the page, I think it's green letters, says the Holy Spirit instills God calls into believers' hearts and directs them to specific places. That applies to all of us. When we're sharing, God, the Holy Spirit instills God's call into believers' hearts and directs them to specific places. Now, underneath the green writing, the next bold, black, bold words is his Jewish synagogues. Mm -hmm. It was their custom. Paul and Barnabas' custom to go to Jewish synagogues and places where Jews were assembled first to hear the word of God. Right. Okay. They proclaim the word of God. That fulfills Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. John was their assistant or their minister. That doesn't give reference to an official title, but it may talk about how John may have been uh, served as working out the logistics of their travel. And he may have assisted them in that way. All right, we're going to look at page uh, 15, verses 6 through 8. Travel the whole island of Paphos in the bold black letters. Bar Jesus means son of Jesus. Now, on the surface, when you hear son of Jesus, you may think, well, hey, this guy's a child of God because this man is the son of Jesus. No. Elimaeus, name means a sorcerer. This God is not a child of God. He's a child of the devil. Paul identifies in that as a little bit later in the next session. Okay? And he tried to turn away the full counsel away from the faith. A child of God, a true child of God, never tries to turn an unbeliever away from the faith. That's, right. mm. That's, right. That's how you know this guy's not a child of God. Even though this guy is Bar means son of Jesus. Son of Jesus. All right. Okay, can we kind of agree to that? All right, let's turn over to the next page. It says at the top of the page is a question. Well, hold on. Yeah, at the top of the page there is a question. Mm -hmm. It says, what arguments do opponents make against Jesus today? Would anyone like to share with us the answer they gave to that question? What arguments do we hear when we share the gospel with, of Jesus Christ with people? What do you hear people that oppose the gospel generally say? Go ahead. Okay, oh, yeah. hold on for one second. Let me, let me get oh, it back here and then I'll get to you. Go ahead. Uh, Jesus is not God. Jesus is not God. We hear that. Go ahead. And the Holy Spirit is a force. The Holy Spirit is a force. Or an influence. Yeah, or an influence. So Jesus Christ is not God. Holy Spirit is a force influence. Go ahead. Okay. Oh. He's a white man. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was going to say. White man's rich. <laughs> what that basically means is because if Jesus is a white guy, black people are not supposed to be reserving right, right. or serving a white savior. That's pretty much what it means. That's one of the things we hear. Well, so my own conference call. Yeah. Can, can, can I add this, too, that uh, uh, people, you know, say, oh, there's many paths to God. Oh, there are many. You know, Hindu, Hindu and, you mm -hmm. know, Muslim, Muslim. You know, Allah. And uh, who is the, uh, the Buddha? And right. Yeah. How can you be exclusive? There are many paths to God. The paths you just named is not just to Christ. Go ahead. And, and I, I, I don't like organized religion. I don't like organized religion. We hear that a lot. 
I don't want to hear that stuff about no organized religion, right? If you Jesus people keep coming in here with that all day. <laughs> I'm just I, I, I have church hurt. I have church hurt. We hear that a lot too. What? Church, 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 church. We have a church. I talk about church, and then they give you a story of a specific thing that happened to them in the church. Go ahead, brother. And yeah, I just want to piggyback on all those things. Uh, the one thing I've heard, and I've heard it more than once, is, is uh, that the principles of, of of the Bible, Jesus, God, are narrow-minded principles. Mm-hmm. That's and, another one. And she said exactly what I was thinking. There's several ways to get to God. No, no. only one way, and that's the narrow-minded piece that they don't like. Right. They don't like that. They don't want the truth. They want any truth that they choose. Correct. They don't want that. All right. For the sake of time, the second part of the question is how does an effective testimony and the truth of God's word combine to overcome opposition? I wrote the answers by praying and standing fast in the faith. We can resist opposition to Jesus Christ when it arises to show the truth of who Jesus Christ is. In other words, when people come and oppose the gospel and oppose you as a messenger of the gospel, you remain in truth to the faith. Mm-hmm. Both verbally and in your lifestyle, that completely destroys any type of opposition that comes forth. Yeah. I'm going to read Lie on the Spirit. That's verses 9 through 12. That's on page number 16. It says, But Paul also saw, also called Paul, built with the Holy Spirit, stared straight at Elamites and said, Listen to this. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trick. You son of the devil. Mm-hmm. Ah! That's who this guy is. <laughs> yeah, you're not a son of Jesus. You're a son of the devil. Mm. That's who you really are. Okay? And this goes on to say, an enemy of all is right. Mm. Won't you ever stop perverting the straight path of the Lord? Now look, the Lord's hand is against you. You are going to be blind and will not see the sun for a time. Immediately a mist in the darkness fell on him. And he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then when he saw, he being the pro council searches told us what happened. The pro council believed because he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. He heard the teaching of the Lord compared to the crooked ways of the sorcerer. People in the occult, what it's teaching, and I was thinking about this, they pervert the right ways of the Lord by taking methods and teachings that are in opposition to the Word of God about who Christ is. They come outwardly in the name of the Lord, in the name of God, and they may on the surface seem like they're genuine children of God and servant of the Lord. But this is an illustration of what Jesus said. Look, they come to you outwardly in sheep's clothing, mm. but in the Lord they're raving in wolves. This is who this guy is. He claimed outwardly in sheep's clothing, but inwardly he's a raven and wolf. And he's being exposed as being exactly that. Go ahead. Yeah, but, and then they know just enough of scripture just to kind of bait you. So therefore, it's, it's imperative that we know the scripture so that we can, can discern it for ourselves and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. Because they always know the surface scripture, so mm-hmm. it pull you in. Yeah, and they'll usually either quote part of a verse, All right. using it out of context. Right. And if you're not careful and you're not grounded in the Word of God, a lot of baby Christians in particular, they'll hear that and grab onto it. She said, well, wait, 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 wait. We have to look at what the whole of the Bible and Scripture teaches on a certain subject. Let's take salvation real quick, and i got to make this quick. On salvation, they will take Scripture, say, for example, like Acts 2.38, where you have to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, just looking at that verse alone, some people would say, look, you have to be baptized in water in Jesus' name and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. But with that verse alone, you would think that's true, but you have to look at other passages of Scripture that are taught about salvation. First, the Word of God lets you know salvation is by God's grace, is unmerited favor and undeserved kindness through faith. What about John? 314 through 18. Mm-hmm. What about uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9? What, what about Acts chapter 13, verses 30 and 31? Uh, what about when uh, Jesus said to uh, the disciples, said, repent ye and believe the gospel? Okay, 
So salvation is by God's grace through faith. Baptism is not, water baptism is not a part of salvation, okay? And then this man was using trickery. He was using forms of deceit and methods of maybe a sorcerer to try to deceive people. Okay. You have Can I ask to, a quick question? Can I ask a quick, yes. just a real quick question? Do you think that these people are always intentional in there, even though the end result may be the same, that they mislead people, do you think that their intention is all, do you think they are always intentional? Do you think it's always that they intend to deceive people, or is it out of ignorance that they're doing it? And this, some do intentionally want to deceive people. Now, people, for example, that are the leaders of major, major uh, cults, they want to intentionally deceive people. But the people in the, in the lower ranks, they have actually been deceived and have also were ignorant of the word of God. Those are the people especially that we need to look out for and win. It's usually the leaders of world religions that intentionally go, go out and deceive people and want to do it willfully. Other people that are a part of these, these cult groups have been captured and ensnared by the devil, not because they wanted to be deceived, but because they thought they were hearing the truth. That's right. And they thought they were hearing the truth based on what our system was saying. That's right. Sometimes they do use some scriptures from the word of God. Right. And a person that is newly saved and hearing that may think that's really the truth. That's right. But they're not grounded enough to know, wait a minute, salvation is by God's grace through faith and not on works. Yeah. Cults always teach, for the most part, in order to have a relationship with God, it's faith plus works. Amen. More so than just all works by itself and no faith. Amen. Okay. So to answer your question, some people do it willfully and intentionally, which was the situation with Elamaeus the sorcerer. Brother Joe, go ahead. And I think to her question as well, some people are just in darkness. Mm -hmm. They don't have spirit they're in spiritual darkness. We have, for instance, Paul here. He was once in spiritual darkness, right? And he was doing things for the Lord. Yeah. When we had uh, also the sorcerer that had the lady, Simeon wanted to buy the Holy Spirit. Right. right. He and was doing it. And then we have in ours right here today, our sorcerer, he's going to get a chance too. Because if you look right there in that verse 11, it says, the sun won't shine on you mm -hmm. for some time. Right. Mm -hmm. God still didn't blind him forever. Right. right. He's got a chance to repent. Right. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Brother Ed. That, that's a good point. Uh, the way Paul is speaking here, uh, Jesus spoke that way in 1234, uh, mm -hmm. in Matthew 1234, the same way. Uh, I call these people vipers. Now, you, you would think somebody that doesn't know the word, they would think that uh, this was the wrong uh, speaking uh, pattern for Paul. Yeah, no, it's what Paul said. This way. Yeah. And he called them out. Sometimes you have to call people out. Mm -hmm. And it may sound harsh. If you say somebody's yeah, yeah. a brood of vipers, hey, that's not being kind of right. about it. Hey, what you doing? Oh, no, 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 hold it, hold it. No, these Pharisees know better. Right. This is wrong. Right. But Paul knew also because he was blinded on the road to Damascus. That's right. right. So he knows something about blindness, too. Mm -hmm. Yes, he right. does. So. All of this uh, brings back other verses, and this is what stretches on. A person that doesn't know Christ, their minds are blinded in their unbelief. That's right. They're in darkness. Yeah. We were all in darkness That's at one right. time. Including the person sitting here teaching you right now. <laughs> That's right. right. All of us were. So we needed to hear the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ would shine into our hearts. That's right. Look, this man knew who Jesus Christ was. He was perverting the right ways of the Lord. Right. That word pervert means to distort, mm -hmm. to, to, to make sure you, you deliberately deceive people. Mm -hmm. right. He knew who Christ really was, mm -hmm. but he decided not to follow him. Mm -hmm. So, yes, this man was like Paul. He was blinded for a time. Right. Remember, in Matthew 23, to answer your question, do you think that people are willfully doing this? The Pharisees were willfully <laughs> deceiving. Yes. Now the people that were I, 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 I think there's a profit motive too that you know the money you, 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 I feel like and he attached himself to someone who was a leader who was higher up okay so now, I, I, I feel like there's personal gain also involved with cult leaders and people like this 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 man that means you, know? right, you said a profit motive that was one of the things you said and status and, and status there's some type of ulterior motive. Normally people are drawn 
in terms of uh, being involved in, in, in false religious and misleading people, because there's money involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they want to gain influence mm -hmm. to, to promote themselves. That's absolutely right. That's what uh, Peter talked about, false prophets, in Second Peter chapter 2. Mm -hmm. And he talked about the wages of unrighteousness, unrighteousness. and they're being involved in greed. Yeah, people a lot of times are motivated for that reason. And the other reason they're motivated is because of wanting to gain influence. Notice he was next to the pro council. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He wanted to gain some type of influence with him, yeah. not only to deceive him, but other people. All right, let's turn over to page number 17. And it says in the last paragraph above the question, the Holy Spirit empowers us to do the kingdom works he calls us to, to do. God's word is sufficient in itself. Occasionally, the Lord displays his sovereign power as further witness to his authority. Now, we just saw in the passage God's displaying his sovereign power. Mm -hmm. so but Paul not only calls out his character, right. you're a son of the devil, full of all subtility and, and wickedness. You also see the power. He was blind for a time. There was a mess and he couldn't see. That was God's sovereign power, okay, that he's talking about. And he said, further on, as we testify for Christ and the power of his spirit, we can see the greatest miracle of all, people saved through faith in Jesus. Amen. The question on page number 17 says, how does the Holy Spirit's presence, presence influence, the Holy Spirit's presence influence our perspective on obeying God in faith? Anyone like to share with us the answer they gave on that part of the question? How does the Holy Spirit's presence influence our perspective on obeying God's word and faith? I feel like the Holy Spirit empowers us to do the kingdom work. Okay? Second part, in what ways have you seen the effect of spiritual witnessing for Christ? Would any of us like to share with us the answer they gave to that question? It's asking us what effect did you see. Go ahead, Sister Rowena. Uh, through witnessing, I've seen, um, you know, a lot of people come to Christ, confess Christ, and from various, uh, you know, walks of life and in different situations. Okay. Praise God. Amen. And that, that's a miracle. You see people come to Christ from various walks and situations. Right. That could mean somebody that was one time a drug dealer or a prostitute come to know the Lord. Somebody that was an atheist or an agnostic, mm -hmm. they came to know the Lord. Somebody that was trusting in their own works and righteousness, they came to know the Lord. Okay, it's a Bible skill. Use other scriptures to help establish, understand a Bible passage. Paul's accusations against Elimaeus in Acts 13.10 express the sorcerer's intention to distort the straight path's desire by God. Old Testament passages also examine God's path for his followers. Read these passages from your Bible. Proverbs 10, 9, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, Isaiah 59, 8, Hosea 14, 9, Micah 3, 9. Now I'm going to go ahead and share with you what I have written down to us. How do these Old Testament passages provide greater understanding of Paul's point in Acts chapter 13, verse 10? Let me read verse 10 again. It says, and said, you are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery, you son of the devil, an enemy of all that is right. Won't you ever stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? Now, there's several key words there. Call him a son of the devil. All of uh, let me see. So I'm reading this. He says, uh, full of deceit and trickery. You're an enemy of all that's right. Stop perverting the straight ways of the Lord. Mm. Opposite of straight crooked. Mm -hmm. So one of the things false prophets do, one of the things false religions do, sister, you said it, they take scriptures, but they twist the meaning of them. In other words, the passages that they do use, they don't give an accurate interpretation and an application of them. That's the problem. Okay. When you look at these passages, it says, write a brief description of the law of God's path is depicted in the select passages. I said the Lord's way revealed in his word is always right, just, mm -hmm. and wise. Mm -hmm. It produces peace and right judgment. Mm -hmm. What Elimaeus was doing showed none of these things. It didn't show wisdom. It didn't show justice. It didn't show the right ways of the Lord. God does not need astrology books 
to help you predict the future. We have his word. Amen. God doesn't need crystal balls and you go into a crystal ball gazer to find out what's going to happen in the future. Amen. God doesn't need you to call up through a, a medium, go to what they call a seance, and there's a group of people there to call up the spirit of a dead relative. And it's referred to as a seance. And that's what King Saul did Amen. in First Samuel. When the Lord wasn't speaking to him through prophets, because the disobedient, oh, I'm going to go to this witch at Endor, and here's the first spirit I want you to call up with me. I want you to call up a, a, the prophet Samuel. And when she saw the spirit, like, wait a minute, who's this? Well, describe him to me. Describe what he looked like. And, and, and she was frightened out of going, you're King Saul. I, 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 don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you. Because he had gotten rid of them. And, uh, and Saul rebuked him. So seances are, are a group of what they call a seance is when a group of people get together and come to someone, an individual called a medium. And that medium's purpose is to call up the spirit of a dead individual that had died. That's actually a demonic spirit imitating Jesus. Right. That's who it is, Brother Ed. I just want to say, uh, we notice that this guy's not doing this out of ignorance. No. Okay. This is intentional. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that old. I don't know any better. Oh, yeah, he knows better. But right. He, but he's uh, smoothed his way up to the full council because mm -hmm. you know, he's got a high office. But then if he can convert at that level, he's probably got it. Yeah. So think that through now, folks. False prophets will twist the scriptures. Yeah. They use them in a way that to a babe in the Lord, an unbeliever, sound right because they don't want all of what the Bible teaches on a certain doctrine. <laughs> and they also use not only twisting the scriptures in terms of misinterpreting them, but they also use other methods as well. They may use occult methods mm -hmm. to try to turn people away from God. So to go ahead. I, I was thinking about baby Christians, baby Christians, who create a, a baby in Christ and use expression like, God help those who help themselves. We are that a lot, don't we, folks? Yeah, but that's not difficult. That's not difficult. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I've heard it too. Yeah. I no. say, uh, yeah. God helps people that are helpless and hopeless. Yeah. If you can help yourself, if you why, 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 Jesus why, have to die? Why, yeah. why did Jesus have to die? That's right. I'm going to have to go ahead and close this out. I know. I I know. Know. Yeah. That was so hard. I'm going to move it over. I want to apologize for that. So the Holy Spirit works in us, calling us to kingdom work. That's one of the ways this lesson applies to us. The Holy Spirit works in calling us to kingdom work. Believers should be prepared for opposition so that they will be ready to stand firm. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do the kingdom work he calls us to do. Those are the three things I want us to take away when we talk about listening. We have to listen to the Holy Spirit through his word, and we have to be obedient. Through sharing, through sharing the gospel, we're going to encounter opposition. We saw it externally this time with Bar Jesus, who Paul called out to the son of the devil, Elimaeus the sorcerer. You're not a son of God. You're the son of the devil. And we also seen in relying on the Spirit. That's how we're going to especially apply the last thing. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do kingdom work he calls us to do. Relying on the power of the Spirit. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes in prayer. Thank you for all being here this morning. Forgive me for running over a little bit. There's just some things I wanted to share a little bit earlier in the lesson, even before we got into this book, to kind of set the tone. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, we thank you, O oh God, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you and praise you, O oh God, for this morning's lesson, O oh God. We ask you to right now help us to see ourselves as sent and set apart by you, Father. Lord, we thank you for our sister from the islands, Lord. Thank you for the three months that she has been here, Father. I thank you and praise you for thank you and praise you for her love for you, for her desire to grow in grace and in the knowledge of her Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I pray that all the things that she has learned and applied in her life for the three months that she was here. As she go back home, Heavenly Father, that she will share those things and be a light in a dark place, Heavenly Father. And if she does encounter opposition, and I think at some point maybe she will, that you will strengthen her and help her to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to stand firm in the faith, faith in the midst of the opposition, and be a loving witness to Christ. Lord, I pray that all of us will do that as well. Amen. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you.